Next part of the repair series on this thing. We're just going to do some basic stuff on this one today. It is basically working, does seem to be functional. Calibration is very slightly out. I'm not sure if there's something wrong with the meter actually because looking at the needle, every time I look at it, I think it looks wonky. And if I look at it straight on, I don't even see it on camera or not, if I get close enough, can you see that one side of the needle was on one side of the zero and the other side is kind of on the other side. <laughs> Alright, so it looks like the needle might be slightly bent. Like if I get that lined up so it's smack on the bottom zero, like that, you see it's to the left of the top zero. So I actually think this needle might be slightly bent. And even when it's not weird, it's just, I don't know, it just looks like it's off to the left. It always looks that way. Even someone look at it, it's like, it looks like it's leaning to the left slightly. I don't know if it's just like imagination or, or what, but it just seems like it is. I'm pretty sure the top of that needle is bending over. See? Yeah. That needle is very slightly bent. But also I think it should be about there, not over here. I think it's very slightly off to the left as well. It's a bit weird. So what I want to do now is actually look at doing a battery pack. So this originally has a battery pack in it. You know, this is how they're designed to run. Got a battery function here. So you have that, you'd be running with battery and there you'd be running with AC. Off would normally be charging the battery and if you need to check the battery status, you can push it over there and it should give you an indication on the meter here saying what the battery level actually is. I've got no idea how that actually reacts. No idea. This battery pack that is supposed to be in this thing originally, long gone, who knows where, probably a good thing, good chance it'll be leaking everywhere by now because this thing is made in the 60s. I've got a nickel metal hydride battery here, NIMH. This is rated for 2.1 ampere hours, 6 volts. Now this is supposed to be a 6 volt battery in here, as original, so it's the same voltage rating. But I want to measure on the side here, these terminals, that's where the connections go for the battery on this side. So there's actually a standoff mount here with terminals, you screw the battery terminals onto. The battery's normally mounted down here. What I actually want to do is mount this down there. Double side tape it to the side. These wires can go straight to those terminals. All fairly compact, easy to access, that sort of stuff. But first I want to measure the voltages here to make sure that they're not excessive in case there's something a bit much going on there as far as voltages for this. Just in case I need to take some precautions about overcharging these things. It's not going to be getting used that much. It's mostly going to be put in storage and just used occasionally when I need to pull it out. To some precision measurements will be used for that. Which is why it needs to have the battery pack in it. Because this needs to be used for the low levels. I need to make some precautionary measurements first. When I see all the voltages here, I'll get this thing half hooked up. Then I'll check the current as well. See what charge current it's using. And we'll just go from there. Just in case I need to change something to control this. I might need a, a charge controller or something on it. It's possible. I'm hoping not. I'm hoping I'll snap this thing in and it'll work because in theory it's the same voltage and it should be very similar to original batteries. Hopefully. 24 volts. Well, that's a bit more than 6, isn't it? Wow. <laughs> that's curious. If it's trying to charge up 24 volts, that could be a problem. Why is that 24? Let's turn the power on see if any changes. 25, it gets worse. Okay. Hmm, that might change things a little bit. Why is the voltage so high? Maybe I need to uh, get a different meter and try something else. So I've got my Fluke 289 here, low Z mode, but it's got low Z on AC. But this does an AC and DC readout. 11 volts AC, 23.4 volts DC with a low Z option. That's a lot more than 6 volts. What's going on there? So I'm still trying to track down why this voltage is a bit weird. So I've put a capacitor across this connection here to try and smooth it out to add a bit like a bit of a load and help smooth out the AC because it's got a half rectified AC there. So adding a capacitor will smooth it out and give us a, a better DC representation. I'm getting sort of 37 volts unloaded. I'll put some loading on it and get down to like 34. But that's still a long way away from the 6 volts or just above 6 volts I was expecting. So still digging into this. Something is a bit weird. I don't know what that is yet. But something's a bit weird. So I'm just going to measure on the transformer output, hopefully. From here to here. What do we get? Quite a bit of ripple, but we are expecting that because it's basically not filtered there. 14 volts DC. That's what it runs at, 14 volts. What does that tell us? Not much. So looking a bit deeper into the service manual for this, it actually specifically mentions a 6 volt 4 amp hour battery. So now I know exactly what's actually in there. So it's supposed to be a 4 amp hour battery. Now the one I want to put in is only 2 amp hours but I don't care. It's not going to be used for long periods of time. It's going to be used occasionally once in a while. So that's fine. But the weird thing is, let's say it is definitely a 6 volt battery. So I'm just going to shove a voltage into it first and just shove 6 volts in and those battery terminals from my power supply 
and we'll just see if it runs. That will prove once and for all the batteries definitely create voltage. And then we have to figure out why that voltage is like up to 37 volts when it's been smoothed out by the capacitor. Because that does seem excessive for a 6 volt battery. You know, obviously you've got a charging circuit, so you do need to have a voltage higher than that to be able to charge a battery, but having it five times higher, a bit much. So let's just try powering this up now. AC power is turned off, so it's not trying to charge, because that could be disastrous trying to shove voltage back into a power supply. Some power supplies can tolerate it, most of them can't, and you end up blowing up your power supply. Um, you need a proper four quadrant source menu for that, really. Anyway, turn the power on, that's running at 6.5 volts. No current's currently being drawn. Change the battery position. Okay, it started up. It's drawing 200 milliamps and it's collapsing the power supply. I've got the current limit set too low. 700 milliamps, set to that. So that is running off 6.5 volts and now it's settled down. It's doing just under 400 milliamps. So it looks like you would actually run from that voltage. Now let's inject the voltage into it and see if that works too. Let's just shove these in the terminals here. It should be good enough for now. Just testing. Shove those in there. Let's do. 100 millivolts, yes that is working. 200 millivolts, yep, that's definitely reacting to that. One volt should be full scale and it basically is there. So yes, this is actually operating off 6 volts just fine. So a 6 volt battery will run it. Shall we see what voltage it will drop down to before it decides to not behave properly? So 6 volts, I'm trying to hold these terminals on. The chopper is changing, you can hear the chopper changing. That's 5 volts. Four volts. Do here guys, Ness killed it there. Bring it back up again. So it looks like you could say probably safe margins four volts. Absolute minimum. Maybe if I get a good connection again. But it sounds happier above six. The chopper frequency doesn't change between six and seven. Five point seven the chopper frequency changes. So I need to stay above five point seven. We have a little bit of information at least. Well I'm gonna try an experiment. I've got a six point two volt zener here which I'm gonna to use to effectively simulate the battery loading. This probably will go bang. But put I don't know if it's gonna last. Because <laughs> we're dropping thirty seven volts down to six point two volts through a big resistor. It's a ten watt resistor it drops down through, so it's expecting a lot of power. This is a 1 watt zener. 10 to 1 difference. Uh, we'll see what happens. But I've got the meter here set up. Oh, better put the DC, I wasn't going to make much sense. So DC amps. We should be able to see how much current's also trying to go through the zener to drag it down to 6.2 volts. And it might give us some more information about what's going on and how safe the circuit actually is to put a battery into and what I may need to do to make a circuit work. I think I'm just about ready to try this. I've got it set to battery position so it won't actually be trying to power it straight away because battery position doesn't try and power it. So it should be able to turn the AC on, be safe there. As soon as I turn it to the off position, that will then be trying to apply power to this zener. And we should see a current. And hopefully it's not more than 10 amps. <laughs> if my fingers start melting and smoking, let me know. Two hundred sixty milliamps. That's not that bad actually, I was expecting more than that. Question is, how hot is the zener getting? Because don't forget, it is dropping a lot of voltage through that resistor as well. That's getting pretty hot. I can't keep my finger on that, definitely not. But that's only 260 milliamps, so that's the maximum charge current it could potentially put into the battery at 6 volts. That's maximum charge current. That's what that's telling us. So now the current, we know that resistor there is a 10 watt resistor, 56 ohm. We've got some numbers there we can actually use to do some maths and figure out the voltage drop across that resistor and things like that, and how much power has been dissipated in that resistor. But this Zener is very hot. I could get the thermal camera out. Let's do that. So that Zener is 144 degrees or so. 145. The uh, clip leads are about 44. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that Zener is absolutely cooking. That is 151. Yeah, 151 degrees. It's still going up. Let's uh, turn it back off again and give it a break. I'm standing at 98 now, AD, it's dropping down quite quickly. Yeah, interesting experiment. So I'll just try different Zener diodes. This one here is the 6.2 volt, which we tried before, which was drawing about a quarter of an amp, which is like its maximum charge current. This is basically simulating what the battery would be doing, all right? From what I can tell. 
but that's a lot of power dissipation going on in here. Now there's a resistor in here which is designed to drop the voltage and drop the current to that battery. That's getting quite hot, it's like up to 90 degrees or so. But there's also the diodes which feed it from the transformer. They're getting about the same temperature, it gets to almost 100 degrees. And it'll probably keep going up and up and up until it you know, probably fails. But that seems like an excessive current, it doesn't like that. So if I've got a 24 volt zener here, that draws about 100 milliamps instead, which is doing a lot better. The resistor's running colder, it's running about 70 degrees. The diodes are down to just below 50, which is a lot better. Still a bit on the high side, but tolerable. That's okay. It could be nicer. But that says 100 milliamps is like the largest current we want to draw through this thing. Now, if I can do less than that, it's even better. And I probably can. I want to cap that voltage so it's a safe voltage for the voltage regulator I end up using. Because I'm going to use something like a 7999, and that can then drop that voltage down from like 30 volts or so down to 9 volts. Now those regulators can't handle too much of a input voltage, I don't like it. So the 37 volts or so that we're getting floating in a circuit here, that would be bad for it. It will likely blow it up. So if I get down to about 30 volts, that'd probably be okay. I was thinking 24 volts because this is a Zeno I've got, it's 24 volts, but that's probably too much still. I think I need to go about 30. That should halve the current roughly. So that should be about 50 milliamps going through the zener. That will leave power left to go through the charge circuitry and charge the battery. If I can get this design right, I can actually do this so that the battery could be left on charge indefinitely without damaging it and without things overheating. Originally, from factory, these could only be charged for about seven hours if we had to stop charging them. Otherwise, you'd overcharge the battery, according to the manual, by the way. So I think if I do this right, I can have this so you can charge it up and just leave it on charge, it'd be fine, it'd be perfectly safe. And obviously the trade-off in that is that it will take much longer to charge up. It might take you a day or two to charge it up. But so what? If it runs for two or three hours, I don't care because that's plenty of runtime for me. I might only use this thing for 10 minutes at a time. Once a year or once or two years, I don't know. I don't expect to get much use out of this. I will use it, but it's not going to be something I use a lot. But I need to be ready to go, which is why I want nickel metal hydride. I need to make sure this system is good. Another alternative is to completely change it and just not charge off the internal power supply at all and that is to run my own power supply to it to charge the batteries up. You just plug in a plug pack, and charge up the battery, and that'll do it, and that's it. And ignore the original charge circuitry. That's an option, but I'd rather keep it as original as possible and just modify that charge circuitry so you don't have to think about it, you don't have any special weird things you have to do. You just plug in the power and use it like you would do normally. That's what I'd rather be doing. There's always options. So what my current plan is, is to have a zener across the output for that resistor, which would normally go to the battery, right? So that's gonna drop the voltage down slightly make it safe for the regulator. Then I can have the regulator going to a current limited system, so like a, a 100 milliamp current limit. So I've got a little board which I designed a while ago, and that's a 100 milliamp current sink or source how you want to approach it. It's, it goes in series with a supply rail and it limits it to 100 milliamps. So that I could put in circuit and that will limit the current to 100 milliamps. If I put that on the low side of the regulator, that will limit the regulator output to 100 milliamps max, which takes stress of the regulator. It takes stress of the rest of the circuitry. And of course, you're dropping the voltage down, it may have an impact on that as well. You know, power dissipation, stuff like that around the circuit. That's an option. I could always change it to a different current. I could make it less than 100 milliamps. I could modify the circuit so it runs at, say, 50 milliamps instead and be even better. That's something I'm likely to do. But I think that's what I need to do is build that charging circuitry and modify this to power a 9 volt battery pack, not a 6 volt. Even though the 6 volt's the original pack, if we go down to 9 volts and use a negative 9 volt regulator, that will mean that you can actually have this thing plugged in indefinitely without overcharging the battery because you've got 9 volt regulator, 9 volt battery pack. You'll never fully charge a battery pack, that's fine. But you never also never fully charge it to the point where it overcharges. Bit convoluted, took hours to get here, but we did. One eternity later. Right, here on this breadboard I've got a little regulator mocked up. So this is actually functioning and this is currently charging this battery. It's been on charge for almost a day now. And I'm just monitoring the actual current usage. I've already simulated this with my DC electronic load, and I'll show you that in a second up there, just to show you what it's doing. I'm sure I've got the right values and stuff I need on this to actually get this six volt cell to charge nicely and not overcharge. You can trickle charges, you can put a just constant current on there, but it has to be really small. A recommended blow, is it 0.03C or something, is the recommended minimum for these cells. You can't put a high triple current into them. And I'm actually going below that. I'm actually doing less than that. I'm just allowing for the fact it could be left plugged in for a week before I remember I need to unplug it, that kind of thing. Because this is the sort of thing I'd use very often, so it doesn't really matter that much about leaving it charging. 
but I've tried to get the profile right so it's got a fairly high current charge rate when it's when its battery is very low and as it's, the charge is basically full it will drop that charge rate right down purely by the tuning of this regulator here so this is an LM337 negative regulator and I've also got in a series resistor and a diode to stop backflow for the battery into the regulator circuit when it's sitting there idle not being used now I've already built a circuit just here, a bit of a spoiler I might actually get this thing built up properly and actually get a design made for a proper board and get this made because this sort of thing I might use more in the future so I think I actually will just get one of these boards made up properly and actually do my own board but anyway, here's a 337 a couple of swiveling caps that's the input side, that's the output side in this case I put quite a large input cap because the Keyfleet doesn't actually have any smoothing caps on this charging circuitry it's just a diode bridge or it's even a half bridge and that's it so that's all it has so I've added a slightly larger cap here it's slightly still under microfarad but it should be sufficient it's quite a big overhead on it and I've got 10 microfarad on the output side and obviously tuning resistors that big resistor there is the output side so it passes through that's just a 10 ohm and then there's a diode there as well I've got a couple of wires hanging off right now just to do testing on it that's what we'll be putting in so I've disconnected the battery and now you can see the readout for the voltage it's 14.7 volts maximum from that regulator when it's got no loading on it whatsoever All right now I've got this set to constant voltage mode and if I turn this on so it's limiting the 7 volts which is basically the top end of this battery charge rate bring it over to say 7.1 that's actually the actual top end 7.1 that's only doing you know less than 2 milliamps that battery voltage reaches full capacity it's going to be putting almost no power into it now if I drop this down 6 volts is doing about 50 milliamps which is the normal battery voltage 5 volts which should be the minimum voltage the battery can produce but it's you know, basically flat it should be 5 volts because it's got 5 cells and that's 123 milliamps or so the actual range that this is offering is quite good if I go down lower, say if I go down to 4 volts it's doing like 300 milliamps but the most this circuit can provide is about 250 milliamps I think it was so I'm not too worried about that part so like I said that mock up was on the board here and I basically replicated it on this breadboard and the only difference between that and this is this resistor here is 10 ohms on here is 12 ohms this gives it slightly more current not much it's a few milliamps I've already done testing on this one and at about a 7.1 volt mark it's doing about 4 milliamps so I think that's still a perfectly acceptable trickle charge rate for these batteries and the chances of this thing actually being left on power the entire time anyway it's like zero so I'm not actually too worried about that I just wanted to get the lower charge rates just a little bit higher because it did make a difference to that just so it does charge quicker when it's initially powered up because when I use this Keyfleet which this thing's going into what will likely happen is I'll be using the thing for well, a few hours you know I might have it plugged in for a day maybe and that'll be it and I'll put it away again that's likely how I'm going to use it so this battery needs to have a decent charger on it so I can charge off a decent rate when it is plugged in not necessarily fully charged not worried about fully charging I mean it would be nice but I'm not overly worried about fully charging the battery as long as it's got a decent charge rate going into it so it, it does kind of top it up and without overcharging they can tolerate overcharging a little bit you have to be careful not to overdo it because you will damage them because they, they end up producing heat and stuff like that they're actually slightly less tolerant than my cats from that point but I think this is a better battery long term that's enough wobbling it's got the thing in there so the placement for this power supply board I've got it figured out already so if you look at this PCB from the bottom you've got four holes here obviously ventilation for the original battery I'm guessing that's what those are for because the battery used to be above the circuit board or some mounting system maybe but you've got four holes there which is great because it means I can stick a bolt through the top side of the board there's nothing in there that's where the battery used to be I'm actually planning on just popping this board here out which is the power supply board and we'll bolt this in directly onto that circuit board just like that and just run some wires off it and, and run to where we need to go so what I've got to do is modify it up here so the connections I need to make are down here got a big resistor here that's a 56 ohm resistor on the bottom of the switch we've got two diodes which come across you can just see the little teflon wire or whatever it is over there anyway there's two diodes come down here they join together run to a wire which runs around the back of the switch using it as a mounting system onto that end of that resistor so that's where the AC comes in is here you have a resistor which is what normally limits the current to the charging battery that's then got a wire link that comes across to these switch contacts this is the battery connection here that 100k resistor is used for the meter for testing the battery level so what I've actually got to do is cut right there on that wire right there to separate that resistor from the battery I need to inject the charging circuitry at that point so that means then it will 
feeding AC in, charging, going to the charging circuitry, coming back, and then going to the battery. Now, I don't actually have to bring a wire all the way back. I don't know where that wire goes at the other end. I can't actually trace that out. I know where that goes to. I only really need to bring one wire up and connect it to this point just here where I'll cut it. So I'll cut it there and I'll connect the wire to that. And that'll give me my AC input, which will go to the input of that regulator circuit. And then I can then tap it off to where I need to go directly to the battery end over there. There's the battery terminals there. So the black is the negative side of the battery, which is actually minus six volts and the white is zero volts, just to be confusing. All right, so I've put together the bits. So we've got a little bit of heat sink here. I was on the fence about whether or not I needed to put any heat sinking on. It doesn't really get that hot. It's probably a good idea to put a little bit on anyway. If it does have a, a situation where the battery is very flat, it could be drawing 100 milliamps. And so putting a little bit of heat sinking on to kind of help it slightly. I mean, even 100 milliamps, so this could tolerate it. This wasn't getting that hot. You couldn't really hold your fingers onto it, but you could touch it briefly. So I've also got a rather long M3 bolt here and a little top hat thing, I suppose you can call it, which goes through the TRT20 like that to insulate it. I mean, purely just as a spacer for the bolt. Um, although that seems to be awfully long. <laughs> Sticks out the back of the device. Might trim it down a little bit. It doesn't actually need the insulator in there, but it'd probably be just helpful to get things aligned and just make sure it's all sitting nicely. Because the piece it's, it's going to be bolted with two is insulated anyway. It's not exactly mounted onto a chassis. Could mount it to a chassis, but I'm not going to. I'm going to put it straight into that circuit board with this and uh, that should be fine, I reckon. All right, so I've got the wires on the board here. They're roughly the right lengths I need. I'm probably going to be cutting some off to waste a bit of wire. Don't like to waste wire, but sometimes it's just necessary. And I have just noticed I've lost a piece. There it is. I need this bit. Now this bolt is massively too long. It probably won't matter. So I'm going to mount this to the heat sink. Or poke it on the heat sink. Then uh, shove it into the one of the holes on the PCB and hopefully it'll be good. Now I've got to do it this way around unfortunately, but it's still enough coverage on the actual heatsink part of the transistor. Well I prefer it the other way around, but it's a bit close to these other parts, so it's better to do it this way. Now, the only thing I might need to do is put washers on this bolt here, on that nut, because the holes are quite large. Alright, just mounting this in here now. Got a nut driver that fits beautifully, so that's all good. Okay, it's all compressed down. Just make sure it's not touching that track. Yeah, that looks fine off the way, that's fine. Happy with that. Let's check in for the actual terminal. So I'll go from the switch, which is the battery connection side of it, down to here. That top one of those, there's two connections there. The top one of those two goes to the switch, which is the battery connection. So that's where I need to put the brown wire. And I believe the one below it is where I've got to put the black wire and it does so yeah, those are two connections I need to use right there that's fine that's verified all right so now I'm going to cut this wire just here so we'll cut that right there Let's make sure it's not going to touch That is attached, so that should now connect to that resistor. If I do resistance, I should be able to measure from one of those diodes over here to here, measure 56 ohms NOM. So that's working. So I'll do a test, and I'll tie these cables in and tidy them up, get them all cable tied in nicely. Also, you haven't got the battery installed yet. I just want to check the voltage on the terminals and see if it looks like it's working correctly or not. This switch here, the charging circuitry is, on this thing is normally only active in the off or AC state, so there or there. In the battery position, the charging circuitry is disabled. I'm going to power this up this year with a battery setting, which means it should be dead, should be no power. And I'll verify there's no power coming out of that regulator, which I can do by measuring over here on these terminals. And then I'll go to the off state and recheck. And I should see that voltage of around 14 volts or so, roughly because there's no loading on the circuit, so it's going to be floating at higher voltage. And that will confirm then the charging circuitry is working. And then we can actually connect the battery up and see if it actually works. Well, I've got the probes in place. 
turn the power on in battery mode should be nothing there that's correct ready for magic smoke hmm that voltage doesn't look right does it <laughs> what's going on there same thing if I turn it on what's going on there why is that voltage not right what did I get wrong There's always something. So it turns out I'm an idiot, and what I actually ended up doing is the orange wire is the output, and I ran it through to the input side. So, <laughs> so after me originally saying about having a standard about using brown for in and orange for out in these low voltage situations, I ended up putting them in one places anyway. So I've had to swap the wires around on the board. The regulator is probably still fine. These things have got lots of good protection inside them. So there's a good chance there's nothing wrong with that. So we'll try this again, and this time we should actually get. I think 14 volts. We're getting 30 odd volts there, which is interesting. That should be regulating it. Have I blown it up? Maybe. So let's look at the electronic load whilst I power this thing up and we will do testing with the load to see what the load thinks of it and to see if there is an issue with that regulating egg. So that voltage is higher than I was expecting it to be. Turn it on. So there's a 30 odd volts there. What I'll do is I'll do voltage first, I think, yeah. So 7 volts, we're only drawing 7 milliamps, which is actually in line with what I was expecting it to be. Yeah, it's like 3 milliamps to 7.1, which is exactly what I thought it was going to be. That's exactly right. So that's fine. So I don't think we've actually got a problem there. 6.5 is about 42. So 6 volts, which would be a relatively flat battery. 82 milliamps. And 5 volts, which would be a completely flat battery, basically is 166 milliamps. Okay, I think we're doing alright. So most it will go to C25. So that's fine. I think that's actually been okay. Yeah, I think we're fine. So I mean, a fully charged battery is about 7.1 volts, and that's 4 milliamps. So that's absolutely fine. That's working okay. I'm happy with that. Let's hook the battery up. So I've just attached the battery in there, a couple of strips of double sided tape. That's now in place. These wires will reach that connector just fine. So I've got to take these wires off one at a time. Then I've got to do crimping. Oh, I don't, I don't like crimping. I'll never get a good crimp ever. I'm just about set up to do a test. We're running off the battery only. AC power is not plugged in. Got Ian Johnson's PDVST Mini here for the generating voltages, which this thing can check because this only goes up to one volt. And this has got enough precision for me to do the lower stuff. Let's turn the power on. Battery mode. So it's starting up, sorting itself out. Battery test, what does that say? Just over six volts. Excellent, that's right. So this scale, because you did the battery test, it can go up to 10. I was actually originally contemplating putting on a nine volt battery instead of a six volt battery. Six volts is what it originally came with. The circuitry could actually tolerate a nine volt battery, and I was gonna put a nine volt six volt battery in there, but it would have meant a charging voltage of about 11 volts. 11.2 I think it was, something like that, 1.4 volts per cell, which meant it would have gone off scale, which would have been a bit old. So that's why I ended up going back to this being the oh, same as the original with a 6 volt battery. We're slightly to the right of the scale there. 100 milli volts, see what happens. 1 1 volt range on voltage hopefully. Yes, so 100 milli volts, we should go up to about there, yep, yeah, great. So if I can zero this out, if I can zero this out, Yeah, it's not zero. <laughs> I'll have to look at that aspect. Zeroing it properly. Yeah, there's nothing I could do there with that. Not in a one volt range, but yeah, so that's off slightly. There's that second line up. Second line up, that's working correctly. Second line up, 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 second line up. And second line up, so that's actually looking linear. So that's all looking properly off the battery at least. That's good. So let's go down to a lower level. Let's do 300 millivolts. Let's do 100. Let's do 100 millivolts per for full scale. So this should go full scale. Pretty much, yeah. It's going to be slightly over because they're not centered properly. They're not currently zeroed. So that second line up, that should be doing the same things before. Basically, every second line up or thereabouts. Yeah, it's looking like it's all good even on that range. Yeah, that's looking promising. That's all good. 
it'll get into 10 millivolts. Can I do any zeroing now? I might be able to. Should be able to zero it now. I need to look at this calibration of this thing for these high voltages. Nice, so zero that. So now we're on tens, so that would be full scale. And it is, look at that, just about bang on. And it's got about one millivolt at a time. Also not allowing for any stabilisation time, but it looks like it's basically fine anyway. We'll be getting some parallax too, because the, the camera height is above the meter, so you're going to be looking down it slightly. So as it comes over, we'll be looking behind the meter, so that's fine. That's all good. One millivolt. So it'll be full scale. Well, actually it's zero at first. So this is where I'm thinking this needle is slightly bent, and I can see it on here or not. But you see the, z the bottom zero is, is on, and the top zero is off to the left. So I think this needle is very slightly curved. Slightly annoying. Alright, it's got 100 microvolts at a time. You can see it's a bouncing there. Don't feel I've got, got the casing covers on, so it's going to be allowing noise in. So it's actually sitting slightly below on those ones. Let's re-zero it. Slightly below. But it looks like it's basically working okay for these. And it's off the battery, so the battery seems to be running it just fine. So this probably does need recalibrating. I haven't done the things like the chopper frequency, I haven't adjusted those. It probably should be done. The other thing is what right now I don't also I don't have this filter, right? So this bouncing we're seeing. Filter may or may not help it. It has helped it. It's not bouncing as much now. So yeah, but I still want to change those resistors for that yet. So I'm going to try and remove these resistors now for doing the filter. So this is cadmium solder. I'm not familiar with cadmium solder that much. I know it's a bit more dangerous. But fume extraction I know is uh, important. At the moment I'm not getting much movement on melting it. Maybe it does need more heat. What I've got to do is get the wire out first so I can pull the resistor off. That's part of the problem. But even that's not cooperating. Oh, this is going to be fun, isn't it? Yeah. Why can't it be easy? Well, nearly there. Almost got the resistors done. But the two precision ones, anyway. This is not an easy bloody solder to use. It definitely doesn't uh, work as well as the usual stuff. It's taking a lot more heat and that sort of stuff. It doesn't flow as nicely. It's taking a lot more effort to get this done than I thought it would be. Anyway, it is what it is. Surprise! It's been such a pain. Really am. Just about there. Alright, so as the resistors changed, that's those two there done, and that one over there has also been changed. I really like the service finish of the solder on these, so I actually put a little bit of flux just on this one. It did seem to help it slightly, but I'm worried about contaminating the joint. I mean, the whole purpose of using this cadmium solder is that it's a better joint. But uh, yeah, there's a bit of a mission trying to solder these things, but it seems to have gone, so fingers crossed it's actually alright. Well, let's turn this thing on. This is currently off, we'll put it by millivolt on there as well. Put on battery. And we'll see if we see any bouncing like we were seeing before. I'll turn the filter off. Give it a chance to warm up. And we'll try it out. Okay, it's just about on zero now. So, we've put in jets. 100 microvolts. Not seeing any bouncing there. And that's with the filter not turned on yet. So when it's a higher voltage, I'll see the bouncing more. Maybe. But it's still working at least, that's something. <laughs> the input's still good. Let's go lower. Actually zero. I am seeing a little bit of bouncing on that. Very little bit of a movement. Tiny little bit. So we are getting some fluctuations, but I think I don't have the covers on. Now I just want to turn the filter on. I 
still got a bit of movement there. Don't forget, it's not adjusted yet, the filter isn't adjusted. So it's moving about one division there. Turn the filter back off. So it certainly seems more erratic without the filter. With the filter it does seem more stable. Not a lot on it. Like I said, the filter does need adjusting. So I have to figure that out. It's in the manual. Yeah, it definitely moves less. So, we're on the right track, I think.